Welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. This is the top 10 tips, tricks, recommendations, hacks, suggestions, awareness, whatever you want to call them. Don't forget to like, subscribe, keep sharing. Definitely appreciate the shares. I've been noticing a lot of shares lately. Definitely appreciate that. Definitely appreciate it. Before I jump right into the top 10, which is this is week 35, and I thought about calling it, but I'm like, you know what? I can probably get another week because as I'm doing ones, I'm thinking of other ones that I want to do. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, we'll go 30, 36 and maybe next week we'll go 37. I don't know, but it's getting close. So, and I have a bunch more, but I, I feel they're kind of overlapping previous ones. And I've got about 40 more that I feel overlap that I just don't want to use because of the overlap. But got a nice pale ale here out of Winter Park, Florida, which if you're not sure where that is and you don't know where my dad lives, it's near Orlando, Florida. It's just a pale ale called Trucks and Trains by Ravenous Pig. And it's 4.5%, or as some people call a pale ale nowadays, Session IPA, but it's got a ton of flavor. It's got Amarillo, Cascade. After we did that double Cascade, double IPA with Cascade, and I dumped like 20 ounces of it in it. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you straight up, the bittering from this is from the Cascade. <laughs> I know that flavor anywhere. The Amarillo tastes like it was added a little later and maybe even dry hopped. It was double dry hopped, but that Cascade kicks the bitter hard. Before we jump into the top 10, if you hear a little snoring or weird noises in the background, I've got an elderly dog that keeps snoring and I don't want to bother her. She's not feeling too good, so we'll go with it. Number one, crushing calcium chloride, Campton tablets or Warflock tablets. I wasn't even thinking about it this way, but I do it all the time. Some of us don't think about it, but I was watching Pierre on Simple Home Brew and it was so simple. Sometimes we overcomplicate things. He took two spoons, put it in there and just pushed them down, crushed, done. I was like, wow, never thought about it that way. If I have a lot of stuff to crush, I have a mortar and pestle, got that, have not used that lately. This is how I normally do it. The calcium chloride, I like to crush it down, make sure it's as powdery as possible so it dissolves a little faster. Campton tablets, we know, World Flock tablets, we know. But I just, I measure everything. Once I get it measured and I put it in here, then I always do the calcium chloride first because I want it sm smashed up before I add all the other brewing salts. Well, we're talking about calcium chloride. Let's go right into number two. And this is one I learned the hard way. Don't leave calcium chloride exposed to air as it will become wet. Supposedly when it's exposed to 50% humidity or higher, I've had much lower humidity because we run a dehumidifier sometimes. And I didn't see that stuff. It just, I put it out thinking I was getting ahead of the game the night before, and I ended up with this wet mess. Calcium chloride can absorb up to 150% of its weight in water. Yeah, that's why that stuff starts getting little tiny pebbles. And if you let a little more moisture in, suddenly it gets really big pebbles until it looks like giant rocks. Yeah, so be careful. Keep your calcium chloride sealed. Don't let air in there because it's gonna be moist and it's gonna be a problem. Number three is adding brewing salts by using a cup of water to allow them to dissolve. I do this, I dump them in and I touch like that. It's 150 degrees Fahrenheit usually when I'm adding my brewing salts. And yeah, sometimes I get a little heat on the hand and it hurts a little, but what he pointed out is if you just add them to a cup, stir them up for a while, get them to dissolve as much as you can, and then you dump them in, it's much easier. So I may try that here in the near future. I meant to try it last time I did a brew and I totally forgot. Number four, and as you see, we've got some plastic near us, which we'll be going into in a second. But number four, when stirring anything in a plastic fermenter or bottling bucket, use plastic. Do not use metal. Metal can accidentally hit the sides and scratch it or scrape it. And don't use wood. Yes, I know you've seen me use this thing, but I only use it in things that are going to be boiled or are boiling. It's wood. I know it's a hard wood and it shouldn't be very porous, but I see the ridges, I see the roughness. It still can harbor stuff that can cause infections. So if you're doing anything that's going to be fermented, it's already done boiling, it's not gonna be boiled. Yeah, use sanitized, sterile as you can get it, but sanitized plastic, it's much easier. The metal, if you hit it by accident, you could put a little scrape or nick in the plastic. And this could be adding some sort of fermentation you don't want to add. And I'm not going to get it up there easily, so we're going to have to set that down. <laughs> Number five, this goes into the bucket. I know everybody's looking at the bucket going, what's up with the bucket? 
Okay, let's move this out of the way because we all know I'm also accident prone. Is this Lowe's or Home Depot? This is Home Depot. According, number five, according to the FDA, all HDPE2 stamped plastic buckets should be food safe. But keep in mind, if the plastic buckets have been used for something else, you know, paint, chemicals, anything like that, or they've been scratched, uh, you don't use it. Just, just be safe and don't use it. But otherwise, if it's a clean HDPE2 stamped plastic bucket, you should be fine. There should be no issues. Um, little details on here. Home Depot and Lowe's both sell these buckets. They also sell grommets that you can get when you poke a hole. They don't sell bubblers. You'll have to get that yourself. Um, but if you're getting bubblers, I'd probably get the grommets from your brewing store too, because the ones I've seen at Home Depot and Lowe's are like different types of grommets, so you're buying more than you really need. But it's about under $6 for a good sealing lid. It's got a rubber seal in here. This has not been used for fermentation. This is used for a do-it-yourself keg and carboy cleaner that I've used and love using, but haven't used lately. It will seal, you'll have the hole, not a big deal. If you wanna spend a little more than $6, $4 without the lid, you can get these. These are really cool too. They seal really well. And you don't have to sit and fight to get the top off because now you do have some areas that could contaminate later, so you will have to get it off eventually to clean it really good. So there's some pros and cons there, but and more spots to clean too. That may not be the best idea, but it is good if you want to seal up some malts and use that for your base malts. But they also sell food grade approved buckets at Home Depot and Lowe's. And I want to say they're like another dollar or two. It's not a big deal. So if you're really concerned, you could get those. And most of those are white, so you can see if there's any kind of, you know, discolorations or anything like that. But super cheap for fermentation. Super cheap if you want to drill a hole and put an end on it and use it for your bottling bucket. Just crazy, crazy cheap. And I have seen other home brewers talk about using these things and I have not heard of any ill effects. Plus you get a little scratch, you would be out $4, go get another brewing bucket, no big deal. Easy to clean, not a big deal. Number six, your homebrew shop, local or online, is not your only solution for home brewing hardware. And I know you're going, what? Let me explain. A great example. Recently, a friend recently reached out to me and said, man, I was hoping to, you know, keg my beer this weekend. I've got it in my fermenter. There's a bucket actually with a little thing. But he's like, the hose for that won't fit the hose to my keg. It's so much smaller and I don't have something to adapt it. I need a little adapter. And I was like, dude, Home Depot, Lowe's, in the water department where they have all the pipes and tubing and stuff like that. I said, have you ever noticed they got those things that look like duo tights? They also have adapters to step things down in size and they're water safe for drinking water, so they've gotta be safe for moving beer. He was like, huh, I guess I am gonna be kegging some beer this weekend. There's so many things at Home Depot, or Lowe's, or other hardware stores that they carry adapters um, and things like that. If you watch Brian on Short Circuited Brewers recently, he did that sparge or recirculation manifold redux, which that's a lot of words. I call it a little water diffuser because it's kind of spreads the water everywhere. And all the parts were from a local hardware shop. My first submersion chiller, which was built for one gallon, 100%, all the parts were right at the local Home Depot, actually. Bought the copper, did everything. I did use a Quaker oatmeal, big giant Quaker oatmeal container to wrap, just to give it the right size and right shape and not get it bent anywhere. Um, like I mentioned, the duo tights, ooh, wonder where they get that ideal. They pretty much have the same thing, different sizes, different colors at Home Depot and Lowe's. My Whirlpool, yeah. Can't remember if I got that in the tile section or paint section, but this thing is awesome and will run you about 15 bucks, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. And it acts like a bell if you hit it just right too. Number seven, helping the last bit of yeast fall out of suspension. I saw this recently in some instructions and I'm like, are you kidding me? I do that all the time and just didn't think much of it. But yeah, it's actually in some instructions. When I take my beer or my cider or wherever it may be, and I'm bringing it in out of my fermenter, which is in my garage. So I go from my garage, through my dining room, through my living room, to the bar. I set it down and I cover it. And then I either do it the next day or I do it that day when I move the beer. What they recommend is simply jostle it 
or jar it a little, like boom, or give it a nice quick little twist, which has got a lot of liquid, it's not gonna shake around as much. What will happen is you'll see any kind of additional crossing or yeast that's kind of stuck up around the edges all of a sudden come kind of loose. And if you watch it from a distance, especially really clear beer, it looks like it's a little meteor storm. Things are just slowly falling. Cover it up, leave it alone. All that extra yeast that's been sitting up there is gonna fall and it's gonna to fall to the bottom. It can be less you're gonna to have to deal with that could be sitting on top or stuck to the edges of the container that it was fermenting in. I thought that was ingenious. I just have been doing it without thinking about it. And you know, and I've heard other people go, oh, don't shake it, don't move. You don't wanna shake it, but a little jarring, a little knocking, a little twist, and you'll see that stuff just starts falling. And don't just start bottling right then or moving to a keg. Let it sit for the day, part of the day, whole day, a full day and then do it. And you'll notice the majority of that stuff that was sitting up there is now on the bottom. And it's gonna give you a little clearer beer, a little less yeast, a little less B vitamin doses in the beer. Number eight, easy fermenter. And I know everybody's gonna go, well, that's obvious. Yeah, it is to us who've had to deal with it. It's not as obvious to those who've never done it. And I'll explain towards the end and you'll go, oh yeah, I've had to deal with that crap. So easy fermenter. Buy yourself a small, medium, whatever size is affordable for you that works. Buy a chest freezer, deep enough to put your carboy or whatever you're putting in there to ferment. Get an inkbird attachment, help control the temperatures. And you're thinking, well, duh, I can do all that. I've, I know that, that's not, not a big thing. But here's the catch. Some chest freezers will require a modification to function properly. I wish I could remember what it was on this big beast but I had to take the side panel out. I had to sit and play and I got it on the third attempt, but there was wiring in there and everything, every time it would go off and come back on, it would go into turbo mode and it was going crazy. And it was a huge problem. Like, oh my gosh, did I buy something that's not going to work? Understand, I realized this problem after I modified it and did all this stuff to it. I'm like, this is not a good thing. So keep in mind, it is a simple thing to take a chest freezer and add an ink bird and put a little temperature probe in there. But you may want to test it first before you do any modifications to it in case you want to put a cuff or something on there. And make sure it works. And if it doesn't, go Google happy and see if you can find what the modification is you need to do to make it work properly. I do wish I remembered what the issue was on mine, but it was a pain in the neck and it took me three tries to get it. Number nine, another one that seems obvious, cold crash awareness. Yes. Although I prefer to cold crash in a corny keg, so I'm usually pretty safe. I take the corny keg and I move all my beer over to it from my fermenter and I put it in there and I put some CO2 on it and I let it cold crash and carbonate at the same time. Keep in mind, a corny keg is designed for positive pressure. So if you just take a corny keg and you let it sit in cold crash without doing any kind of pressure on it, it creates negative pressure. Negative pressure, I don't think it's gonna damage the corny keg. Those things are pretty awesome. But the seal at the top is designed for positive pressure, not negative, and it could create a small leak, which could suck in some oxygen. Very bad, very, very bad. Now also keep in mind that if you're gonna cold crash anything other than something that you can put under pressure, you need to have some sort of solution. Otherwise, it's going to suck air in, because as it gets cold, it's gonna contract and it's gonna to try to pull wherever it can pull. And unless the thing <laughs> reduces in size, like it's a bag, it's gonna suck some air in. So one of the ways you can do it, and a lot of, there's a couple, I won't say a lot. There's at least one, maybe two companies or people selling a balloon-like apparatus. And what it does is you put it on either during fermentation or towards the end, and it blows up like a balloon or CO2. There's another one I saw where it actually goes down and goes into like a container type system. But that way, when it starts to, pull air back, it's pulling CO2 and it's not pulling oxygen, which is what you want. You don't want to pull any air that's oxygen in there. The CO2 is fine all day long, but just something to be aware of. So when you're cold crashing, you want to maintain some sort of positive pressure, or if there is negative pressure that it's sucking in CO2 and not oxygen. Number 10, I'm going to give this credit where credit's deserved. And this is for David Heath homebrew. I saw this on his. It's a little different than what I do, which I don't usually do very much anymore any, either, but plumber's putty to hold the temp probe when you're fermenting. So if you have this fermenting and you wanna know what the temperature is inside and you don't have a tilt hydrometer or something else that can go inside, 
you take the plumber's putty and you stick that over where the temperature broke, it's gonna give it a better seal and it's gonna help you get a better conductivity, so you say, of the temperature. If and when I've done in the past, I use painter's tape and I prefer frog tape, but it's green. It definitely is not gonna give me as accurate as the plumber's putty would kind of keep that temperature in there. Personally now, I usually set my, set my temperature probe on the very top and I know how much to kind of augment to monitor. And then I also watch my tilt and my tilt is really where I'm watching the temps. So the painter's tape is a lot cheaper than plum, plumber's putty, but like I said, it's not as accurate. So if you're fermenting one thing, you don't have a tilt hydrometer or a little plumber's putty, it's probably a great suggestion. Thank you again for joining us here at Bitter Reality Brewing. Like I said, this is week 35. I'll try to push out week 36, but it's getting close. Don't forget, like, subscribe. Please keep sharing. Definitely appreciate the sharing. Huge. Thank you.